And last, we'll hear from Ellie. You've had a long experience of working with Australia's student mobility programs, especially in Indonesia and elsewhere. How do you see things evolving over the next eight years out to 2030? Thanks, Susanna. Uh, look, first and foremost, I'd like to also thank Auntie Violet for that wonderful welcome to country and extend my uh, thank yous and respect to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people whose land we meet on today. Uh, and I'd like to extend that respect to other First Nations people with us today as well. Um, like Doug, I'd also like to say a huge congratulations to all of you in the room. It is wonderful to see so many NCP scholars and alumni, business champions, university partners, everybody in the room gathered together again face to face. It's so nice not to be looking at Zoom tiles. <laughs> so welcome to you all. Welcome to the ANU. Be about this big if we're... <laughs> They'd all be about this big if There's we were looking at them. Like of tiny screens. <laughs> um, look, thanks, Susanna, for the question. Um, as we've been hearing a lot about this morning, you know, Secretary Campbell spoke about it. Christine's just spoken about it as well. There are many challenges in our region. You know, climate change, gender equality, social inclusion, uh, you know, recovery from COVID, both economically and strengthening health systems, ensuring uh, the stability of democracies in our region. These are all incredibly important challenges that we face together. But I think more important than that underpinning our response to these challenges as regional partners is actually focusing on the quality and the health of our bilateral relationships in the region. We can't do this work together if we don't actually have functioning and respectful bilateral relationships. So to take an example with Indonesia, just last week, uh, Lowy released their poll looking at what Indonesia thinks of the world. And in that, I think there's some pretty um, alarming statistics that we see 55% of Indonesians don't have trust in Australia to do the right thing in the region, in the world. This is actually more alarming when you think that this is a 20% drop since the 2011 uh, polling data that Lowy did. And of course, Susanna, correct me on these numbers um, at, if they're incorrect at all, but a 20% drop since 2011 when that poll was last conducted. So what does this actually say about the quality of that relationship and the way that our neighbours perceive us? I think this is really important to think through in terms of our relationships in the region and if we're getting them right. We need to get these relationships right. We need to get public diplomacy right in our region. Um, the New Colombo Plan, of course, is an incredible part of all of that. And as we've been hearing this morning already, you all have a role to play in that. If we focus it back to looking towards 2030 and the role that you can all play in this, we know that there's 60% of the world's young people that live in the Indo-Pacific region. So in the next eight years, moving towards tackling these issues, you'll all be playing an important role in that work in building the connections as you go out into the region. And for those alumni that are in the community here today, as you're reflecting how you do that work when you come back to Australia, how you maintain those connections with the people that you met in the region. This is really important work. Um, and I think we only need to look at the sort of enduring connections that we've seen with previous scholarship programs like the old Colombo Plan, or now the Australia Awards, to look at the way that those uh, connections and those relationships can be built between individuals and then can actually impact the government to government level as well. So it's, it's really important and I think all of you can play a role in that moving towards 2030 as young people in the region. Mm. Thank you. Maybe we can just stay with you now, Ellie, for, for my next question, which is uh, how do you think the new Colombo plan has already changed Australia's relationships with countries in the region and how will it continue to do that over the next period of time? Yeah, thank you, Susanna. Look, as I mentioned, I think, you know, we know over many years we've seen the effects and we've seen the results of international education as a form of public diplomacy. When you look at it along with, you know, a suite of activities that the Australian government runs, tourism, cultural diplomacy, sports diplomacy and the like, education, uh, international education in particular, as a form of public diplomacy works. It builds these relationships, it encourages you out into the region to make these connections with people your own age and then form those friendships and maintain those friendships for many years. I mentioned just before the old Colombo Plan, now the Australia Awards, we've seen these connections endure over many years through those scholars. 
But for the NCP, if we look at the last eight years alone, uh, you know, we now have a community of more than 70,000 young people in Australia who've gone out to the Indo-Pacific region. Between 2014 to 2019, we saw an 83% increase in the number of Australian students travelling to the Indo-Pacific, understanding our nearest neighbours, having those experiences of being in the region and building friendships. And this is not, you know, these are not insignificant numbers, this is quite substantial. But in, more importantly, I think when we look at that, you know, the numbers only tell one part of the story. And one of the things that I'm really interested in my research here at the ANU, looking at the NCP and relationship building in particular, is when we think of this as part of our, our public diplomacy and our people-to-people -people engagement, our soft power, you know, I almost think that the term soft power is a bit of a misnomer. Um, it implies that it, it's easy, it doesn't take work, it doesn't take investment. But we know that it does. We know that building effective and enduring relationships in our region does take time and it does take investment. You know, and the NCP for the past eight years has been a wonderful step in the right direction in doing that. You know, the numbers alone, as I mentioned, they point to that, they show the kinds of engagement we've been having. Um, the examples uh, that we heard from earlier uh, from Secretary Campbell about what alumni have been achieving since they've returned home. This paints a picture of the kinds of engagement we can see, which is really important. But I think we can extend that even further. When we look to 2030, we look at what the next eight years of the NCP might actually be, I think we need to really think about a couple of things in particular. The first of these is looking at how we engage with our host communities. Mm. I think host communities are so important to the NCP. Uh, they, you know, they're on the ground, this is where you'll be living and studying and interning, the people you're meeting every day when you're over there and the relationships you're building in these communities. I want to see the uh, host communities, I think there's a, a, a much greater role they can play in the design and the planning and the evaluation of the NCP and to see them really engaged and involved in that. Secondly, I hear time and time again from students who return from their NCP experiences and say, oh, I had the most incredible experience, I learnt the language, I'm so passionate about this now, I'm carving out my path, I know what I want to do, but I've come back and there's no room in my degree to study a language. I've come back and I've got no more Asia-focused electives. So what do we do for these students? We've piqued their interest, we know that they want to work back in this region and this is a path for them. But if we're not actually embedding the NCP as part of degree structures by funding Asian languages and funding Asia-Pacific studies in our degree structures, we're only doing half the work. Finally, um, I also think that there is a role for our students when they return from an NCP program and we can be embedding this in the community more if they can see and have the visibility in employability that their skills are valued. And I'll probably, uh, Doug will probably speak more on this in a moment, but Things like job adver advertisements, things like position descriptions, when students are seeing that their skills are valued in selection criteria in job ads, and not just in the desirable, but in the essential. You know, so I think there's a greater role that business can play here in terms of actually saying, we value your skills, we want it to be essential that you can speak an Asian language, essential that you've had experience interning in the region, and we're going to hire you and then promote you later and have that visibility that says, we value Indo-Pacific skills. I think they're all really important in terms of how we embed the NCP. Thanks, John. So we're, we're reaching the end of our time. So as we wrap up, I'm going to ask each of our panellists in reverse order to how we started to give their kind of key piece of advice or tip that they would have if they were starting their career in the Indo-Pacific today. But I thought, Ellie, you haven't had a chance to tell a story. Oh. So if you have a story you would like to tell us, <laughs> then feel free to do so as well. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, well, I guess like Doug, I, my career and my journey really got started through in-country study, but to Indonesia, not to Taiwan. Um, but well before that, it was through language. So my real passion is, around, you may have picked this up, uh, is around uh, languages. And it really set me on my path. So I was very fortunate to study Indonesian uh, at primary school, at high school, and then at university. Um, I also did my undergrad at UTS. Um, and it was part of the International Studies degree program and combined with communications. So five year degree, double degree, and fourth year is overseas. So I was very lucky to spend a year in Indonesia, as many of you in the audience have and will do. 
Um, and I mean, I, I can't even express or, or understate the impact that this has had on my life. Um, the people that I met, the relationships that I forged, um, but you know, the things that you see that you're not expecting to see, the way that it allows you to see the world through a different perspective and to understand completely different uh, worldviews to your own, to understand the way that time works differently, the way that uh, social hierarchies are organised differently, the way that people socialise differently. You know, and these are the, the moments of, you know, people write them off, I think, as culture shock and it's challenging and they're, they're very disorienting and discombobulating when you're in them. But I think uh, it really is in those moments, if you grapple with them and you push through with them, that is where the real change happens for you personally. And certainly for me, that's, that's where change happened for me in my worldview. Um, so to go back to the original question around, I guess, a piece of advice, um, for those of you who are about to head out to the region, uh, I, would, I would really encourage you to keep an open mind and to be curious, but really to take, you know, say yes to opportunities. We've been talking about this a lot this morning. You know, the NCP is an incredibly privileged opportunity that you all have. And I think part of that is a responsibility as well. And it's a responsibility to engage uh, positively and proactively with your host communities, learn the language, to learn about their culture and to be curious about it, um, but saying yes to those things and in particular saying yes to having a different perspective and I think in doing that seeing what you might learn by seeing the world in a different way. That would be my, my piece of advice to those of you going out and for those of you who've already been out in the region and you're back in Australia, again taking the time to reflect on what you have learnt from that experience and how you now see the world differently and can contribute those skills and apply that knowledge to making Australia a more diverse and inclusive place uh, in our region. Mm.